All right, Calvin Castine, April 26, 2018. We're at the Clinton County Historical Association Museum. And we're in a little side room here for a very special presentation. And we're going to ask this lady to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Helen Nursk. I'm the director of the Clinton County Historical Association. And this, yes, is a very special room. It's about uh, the story of the Clinton County story of women's suffrage. Uh, it's never been it's never been uh, recorded before. So this is a first for Clinton County Historical Association. We're very proud of that. Uh, no, once in a while, I get fascinated with word origins. I'm just wondering where suffrage came from because, you know, voting isn't, you don't suffer when you vote. Do you know where that word came from? Suffrage is the right to vote. Uh-huh. So that, if any time they talk about suffrage, it's the right to vote. That's the relationship. So I put that here because that is a question that I had. <laughs> and now we, we say it there. But well, this so, is... so when my wife says she's long suffering, she means she's been voting for a long time. <laughs> you, can, you can interpret it that way if you wish. Yeah. But she might differ. Yes, okay. yes. All right, so... So that's the, that's the, and it's the Clinton County suffrage story in this room, and we set aside a whole room for the story. It's pretty, it's pretty detailed. What happened was initially, um, oh, and about two and a, three and a half, two and a half, three, maybe three years ago, I was skimming through the newspaper and uh, looking for family, and I found out that my great-grandfather was an anti-suffragist, and I uh-huh. thought, well, what the heck is that? I'd like to have met him, yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> thought, gee, and I knew he'd written a book called The American Family, and I started to to, to um, search the word suffrage in our New York State uh, newspapers. And I found this story started to appear, and I thought, I didn't know this. Who knows this, you know? (laughs) So this is what this is all about, what I found about our local story. Now, um, the exhibit has a national, a state, and a county level. This is what was going on, say, and it's very general as far as what was going on in the the, uh, nationally and, and statewide. But we zero in more on what happened in the county at the same time. Let's give a plug here while we can for, you'll probably know the exact title, the historical newspaper site. Uh, Northern New York Library Network, and you click on that, not .org, and uh, they have a historic newspaper site, and it's marvelous. It has, it's it's really the record a record of what has been happening from, I think it starts in 1813, right up through when the Press Republican has its own archives. So that's where we're all written up. And um, we often encourage people to, if they have old newspapers, let us know, because some of those newspapers are from, were microfiched, and the, either, either there was something wrong and so we don't have them all beautifully and so we're missing blocks of history you know so we ask if anyone has an old newspaper just check with us and we'll check if they don't check right. and see if we need it yeah if they've got a better copy then exactly i'm sure exactly. That, that site would love to have a better copy of it but i refer people to that site all the time oh, yeah because it's a gold mine well yeah. i can just think i did do a little research in the past, and you'd go into the Plattsburgh Library and go to their old Michael Fish thing, and you'd just pick a date and hope to find something. Oh, yeah. Now you type in Helen Nurska, and and all of a sudden, you know, all yeah. her arrest records are there. And <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't have. I wasn't that wild as a kid. No, no, but maybe I was in a choir. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or, or part of a church group. Let's put it that way. No, very boring. So yeah, yeah. Very so boring. you can just type in and you pick a. a time period or you can just let it go but you know yeah. if you want to and you can go in. to the exact newspaper if you know that something was done in a per- particular day or a month it's just wonderful people should really anyone doing any research at all i always say have you check there first because oh. uh it's it, you know someone asked me about something about some kind of a um uh, an arrest record, and uh, he was sentenced, and why was he sentenced in this way? And I, I just sort of was curious, you know, sure, curious yeah. question. Well, yeah. And I realized she may not have gone up, or he may not have gone up on the, on the, in the historic newspapers, because there it was, column after column about this guy. So I didn't do the research for them, but I was pleased to know that it never lets, it seems to let you down in one respect or another. So. And the best part is, it's free. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. You don't. It's not something you subscribe done. to. It's just. It's just amazing. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, so it I'm is. Always, you know, I'm bored. I just <laughs> find the topic or a name. Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can get you can get embedded in there, you know, and you you don't want to do it late at night because all of a sudden <laughs> it's going to be two in the afternoon or something like that. So, yeah. All right, so let, I'll try to not interrupt you too often, but I may interrupt you once in a while. So go ahead. <laughs> well, um, the the way this exhibit is set out, we set it out in time periods, and we started with 1848 because that's when the first suffrage um, convention was held in the United States in Seneca Falls, and it was headed by Elizabeth uh, Cady Stanton, and Frederick Douglass was there, and Frederick Douglass definitely supported suffrage. He wanted suffrage for both. Um, um, the freed slaves eventually, you know, and he wanted suffrage for women. After, at some point, he moved away from the women's suffrage movement because they had their own issues well, to sure. deal with. Yeah. So, important. yes, more important. Well, as important. I think as important because then women were the only ones that didn't have the right, you know, right yeah, yeah, to Yeah, but I think slavery is... Oh, ahead. well, slavery was done, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. and, and slavery, slavery was, was done. Okay. Exactly, that's okay. right. Um, uh, but what was happening here was that um, Susan B. Anthony came to town. Now, I had previously only known her coming here because of the abolitionist movement, but she came for women's suffrage, and she came as early as 1855, and she came with Reverend Antoinette Brown, and, and she is also... A very, I mean, all these women have incredible stories, and books have been written about them and everything. So I've just tried to sort of summarize, but this was the first time in Plattsburgh that I have any record of the suffrage movement being discussed. Now, that's not unusual, perhaps, because it only started in 1848, yeah. but nobody, none of our local papers that we have online talked about that meeting. But in fact, um, uh, when Susan B. Anthony came to town, she came here three times. And that's pretty amazing because we're, Plattsburgh is pretty far north and pretty, you know, remote, a, a yeah. small remote population. So that was very, and, and she had, um, so she said, and, and these are things, and she's quoted her, her, which part of her presentation is quoted in the newspaper. And, um, and, but the, what's always you find in these things, this is where, where she spoke. And then the press Republican, in this case, I don't want to, not our, no, sorry, press, Plattsburgh Republican, Republican, which is very different, yep. um, ends it all by saying, in no, in no country is greater deference paid to women than in the United States. And we think she has no right to complain of her social position here because most, most arguments in the anti-suffrage argument, arguments were that socially she's treated with respect, so what's the problem? Yeah. So here, here is the first time I saw it in print from our local, uh, and the newspapers changed their tune. So they did change how they were positioning it, but early on they thought, we're good, so what's the problem? <laughs> so this was the... This there, is, there, there was this a is, Plattsburgh Press, there was a Plattsburgh Republican. That's and right. Somewhere around 75 years ago or so, they yeah. merged. And March 3rd, 1855. So that was, was their Republic. quote. Yeah. Yeah. I try to resource things. Everything's resource. I didn't make anything up. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard, hard to find where I found it. But, <laughs> well, um, that doesn't I, mean yeah. the person writing it didn't make it up, but, but <laughs> that's at least quoting them. exactly right. Exactly. I know. And it, this goes to the Civil War because in the Civil War, they stopped all suffrage, um, suffrage a, attempts to try to get the, the, the vote for women. So that was uh, that didn't happen in the Civil War. So the next thing we go. All right, let's see, next, can, you, can you follow next, along, um, Judy? Yeah, okay. and this is, the next block is, well, Hold I Hold on say, here, look, but, oh. <laughs> that's all right, keep, you can keep talking, just. Oh, uh, all right. Just let you get here so you're facing the camera. Oh, okay, yes, okay. thank you. Um, so what happened was, after the Civil War, all of a sudden, there's a territory that gives full suffrage to women, and that's Wyoming. Uh -huh. and 1869. So, 1869. So, um, and the Anti-Suffrage Society forms in 1871. Now, were any women in this, or just or Oh, all yes, men, men and women. Men, oh, women no, too. no, men and women. Okay. Right. And, um, and in 1878, women's suffrage amendment was proposed to Congress with the exact wording of the amendment that passed 41 years later. Exact word, is that something? <laughs> you know, how long does it take um, for, for women to fight for this? And they did, and it's quite amazing that they stuck with it. Things that happened up till 1880, Susan B. Anthony got arrested for voting 
And there are pictures showing her with her face to the ground, whether that that was an illustration or whether it was, I, I can't say. Well, she was um, unregistered. Yeah. Um, there was a, a suffrage was denied by the New York State Legislature. It was presented to the legislature and it was denied in 1870. Um, I have to get my glasses six. on. Si six. And the answer of the, this, uh, the press Republican was very sorry, ladies, afraid not, you know. And, and so there was this attitude, you know, that it, when you see very sorry, afraid not. Nice try. It could, it, could be, it could be said nicely or it could be said sarcastically, you know. So anyway, um, and here the, um, the national, this is the, what was happening in our state. And, um, and so the more radical, they were called radical, uh, suffrage association based in New York City and wanted to achieve the vote through a constitutional amendment as well as push for other women's rights issues because women could, at this point in time, they had um, the right to, uh, to vote um, if they owned property and they could vote in local school elections oh. and, and on bond elections, and bond, but they couldn't vote for how their kids were treated in school and they couldn't vote for what happened, you know, how the government of, of the, the association that needed the bond, for example, those kinds of things. So the other thing that was happening, and this is, this is happening here, um, is that Anna Dickinson, she came to town in 1874. <laughs> She's apparently like, I don't know, like five feet tall. She had this gorgeous dress and diamond earrings, and she strode around with her message, and they re recorded it in full. And she, at the time, made more money uh, on the lecture circuit than Mark Twain. So she was very, very popular. She was called the Joan of Arc of, of, the, um, of the Civil War because she went around um, you know, campaigning. And these other two ladies, Susan B. Anthony, came back to town. She came back to town in 1879 to talk with us. Mary and, Livermore? And, yes, and, and Mary Livermore. And she, uh, she, again, has her own story. That's what I'm, you know, I don't have the, uh, they wrote, all wrote books. You know, there's a book about everybody. And, I, and I've got this, and I didn't mean to do this, but now that I see I have, this is sort of out, um, framed by men yeah. who participated and who supported the suffrage movement. And there was a man named um, Veter. He was the vice president of the Saranac Horse Nail Factory. He came to us from Pennsylvania. And he spoke in front of the Young Men's Debating Club. And he assumed that they were all agreed that suffrage was the thing. And I mean, but this was, uh, you know, 1872. And he was, so you'll see, though, that Plattsburgh voters did not agree later on. Um, but anyway, he, this is the argument that went through. She's compelled to pay taxes on her property, but not allowed to have a vote in the regulation of the taxation. So, you know, that kind of argument. Yeah, that she can, that, own, she can own property, but she can't determine that's how, right, how, yeah. how the money is spent. Um, Judge uh, Winslow Watson also was, a, was uh, for suffrage, and that was, prob that was probably very significant in this community because he's a well-known personality. And um, so he entered into, and he, uh, he had an elaborate defense. He's reported as having elaborate defense of women's suffrage. Um, and um, his arguments were well-received. But he, he thought women, uh, let's see, uh, get the better, oh, it's an article. He thought it was ridiculous that the better half of the population the women were not allowed to vote. So that was the essence of his, his presentation. Okay, well, uh, before we move on, I, yes. you've got some- Aren't uh, these wonderful? And you know what? Um, a number of these dresses, I need to identify who, who, I know in my head some of them were identified by the Booth family, and, and that will be relevant as we move along, you'll see. Um, but um, I made this a chick's room because it's about <laughs> women you know we do have over and you'll see later we have we do have a, a man's coat but this is all about the fight that women went through and yes we're definitely they were supported by spouses uh, and by families and um but it was a it was a woman's fight so I and can, i call so it a can fight I, can i use chicks too or just yeah those? you can use chicks yeah, I, can I use chicks <laughs> i'm a chick right. <laughs> i'm kind of an old chick but i'm a chick. all right we're gonna let my favorite chick over here reposition that camera before we we move on. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, we are back. Now we're, we're moving on era from era here. The first era was 1848 to the Civil War. And the one we just got done was Civil War to 1880. And now we're moving from 1880 the 1900. Time is flying by here, Helen. That's right. And these women are still fighting for, they did not get the right to vote. Um, however, um, not here anyway. In Colorado, uh -huh. Utah, and Idaho, women got full suffrage. Uh, so in addition, West, huh? the Wild West. So the pioneers, <laughs> uh, those, the, those well, women Most of those succeeded. women had guns, so they had <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But what was happening out there was interesting because that's what it was the uh, new, newer part of the United States that was offering suffrage first. And uh, so that was the good news for the na on the national scene. Um, a woman um, was nominated uh, to uh, the National Equal Rights Party nominated a woman for president. However, since she couldn't vote, it was kind of a, you know, <laughs> uh, a, a, a strange thing. And any votes that weren't counted were rejected because no women could vote. So. Um, Anyway, she died before, actually she died, uh, this is uh, Belva Lockwood, she died before being allowed to vote, and many, many women that you will see did die before they were allowed to vote. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is another one in, in, um, in a, as an example, and she died before. She, these, these women, she started the fight in 1848, so. But in New York State, so what was happening, um, School suffrage was granted to women, and women could cast their vote with respect to school issues. Um, but again, the women's suffrage bill was defeated in the state assembly. And this was a close vote, 59 to 64. Um, but B.D. Clamp of Clinton County voted for um, the bill, and J.W. Sheehy from um, Essex voted against it. So right. that was kind of interesting. Um, Those Essex County folks. <laughs> way behind. And then in 1892, women were given the right to vote for county and district commissioners. Um, so, and, and moving along the statewide, women were getting more, more better organized. Um, and, but then again, in 1895, the New York State Association opposed to women's suffrage is formed. And these, so these were going on at the same time. So there were clubs on both <laughs> sides. Right. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and I haven't read this Bible, I would be curious, published a, the Woman's Bible. And it was a critical examination of the Bible's teaching about women. Oh. So she, she was just <laughs> totally ticked, I think, and just, I'm rewriting this too. You Starting know. with Eve, probably, with <laughs> <laughs> right. coming from a rib. Right. <laughs> and I'd like to point your attention to, um, um, at the time, Certainly, um, uh, the slaves had been, had, had been freed, and everyone, all men were allowed to vote, except women, and definitely, of course, black women and white women okay. and uh, whatever were not allowed to. And I don't, oops, I shouldn't, not all men were. If, I think if you were Chinese, you were not allowed to vote. Oh, okay. yeah. But um, you, uh, all, all of us, most of us were allowed to, uh, men were allowed to vote. But the... Um, uh, black women had to actively, uh, the, the white suffrage groups did not always embrace their cause. So that went on for a while. And there were very um, significant um, activists within, that were devoted to the cause of, of black women getting the vote, as white women so too did too. And so, of course, when the amendment went through, Every, all women got the right to vote, so. Yeah. Uh, but I thought I wanted to, lifting as we climb was sort of their, their um, mantra, you know, because they were trying, still trying, recovering from the, you know, the effects of, of what slavery did to, yeah, the, to their the folks who got picture there, are they national or? Oh, they, yes. Are they, yes, they're did they, very national. Did, did they come here to Clinton County at all? Or? No, they did not. Okay. They did not, no. But Sojourner Truth we know well of the, about because she was from our state, around our state. So, And the other person I should point out, okay, so now this is countywide, back to our county. And um, Carrie uh, Chapman Catt, um, she was the president of the American Women's Suffrage Association. And when we find out we did get the right to vote, she said, in effect, to get the word male out of the Constitution cost women um, 52 years of pauseless campaign. And what she's talking about is after the Civil War, because right after the Civil War, and it took 52 years. 
That is like a battle I find. Who would fight that today? Who would stick with it long enough to make something happen? And I'm sure there are examples, but this is certainly one of them of how perseverance to a, to a principle that you feel is right is, is, you know, is necessary. Again, um, Susan B. Anthony came back to town again. For, and she was elderly then, and they admitted that she was elderly, but they also gave her credit for still being feisty. She, was an, she must have been an incredible woman, her energy level, because she was on the road all the time. These women, um, also um, Harriet May Mills was another very important um, person in the uh, suffrage movement, and uh, Mary Seymour Howell. There are a lot of, of women that maybe their names aren't... Um, they're not uh, as well known, but they certainly uh, were um, important. Um, the, here in, in 1898, the George William Curtis Club, the c club was founded in, yeah, 1898. And um, it's formed in Plattsburgh. It's the first club that was devoted to suffrage. There were other clubs that, that allowed speakers on suffrage, but it was the first club that was totally devoted. And they sponsored special guests like Harriet May Mills and uh, Reverend Anna Shaw. She was also very important in the movement. Um, and then the spit, um, we start to see the Political Studies Club. That was 1899. And you start to see other names like um, Arnold, the name Arnold. And you'll see other names popping out that, that uh, I have a list of 150 ladies that allowed their names or felt it was important enough for their names to be shown as officers of these different clubs and participants. Now, one of the things it says there is that people, when they had their meetings, the, the people who were against suffrage were welcomed and gentlemen were welcomed too. So. They wanted to get their word out, so they're they did, to and that was it. again. I found that in that newspaper that was uh, interesting. That yes, um, uh, th they were always welcome. They weren't so. Here, I'm sorry. I don't this. I sure. um, okay. There's also a list over here. All right. if, can, that's all right. Judy doesn't need to see it. We can just okay of the Clinton County suffrage groups, and it started with the and these are all related to what women were members of were had started were officers of <clears throat> and so clinton county political equity group then the george william curtis club he was a philosopher and um and i, I haven't read a lot about his association with suffrage except that his daughter was pro-suffrage so um any these these clubs were formed under his name okay 1894 then 1898 and then 1899 political study club and some of these clubs morphed into others so um i'm just listing the ones that i found there was a political study club in champlain and if anybody knows anything more about that it would be really good uh, important part of our record because <clears throat> I've asked the Champlain people, and they do not have anything up there about that. Um, they had a, a civic leagues, uh, Women's Suffrage Club of Plattsburgh, uh, and then also there were equal suffrage campaign clubs in Morrisonville, Cherubusco, spelled <laughs> like that then, yeah, okay? E -E yeah, Allenburg so Depot, Chazy, West Chazy. Altona, Champlain, Rouse's Point, Plattsburgh, Schuyler Falls, and Peru. So I think that pretty nicely covers us from, from stem to stern as far as being yeah. uh, concerned about the women getting the vote. That was in 1915. That was in 1915, and they were very active then because there was a vote coming up in, in, um, that, uh, that would allow um, the amendment to be added to the New York State Constitution. So that was coming up. So there, these clubs were very active then. After 1915, there was a New York State Suffrage Party, which was a overall over New York State. There was a Plattsburgh branch formed. And then in 1917, I found the Morris people. I don't think Morris, nope, nope. Morris, Morris popped up. They finally uh, got on board. <laughs> well, or they, or they were, somebody was remiss in leaving them out of that list. Well, no, no, they could yeah. have been part of the Ellenberg or the Plains. Oh, Green yes, Plain exactly. Or whatever, Shady Group or There whatever. was a suffrage coffee house that was right outside the base. Mm -hmm. And then Morrisonville Suffrage Club. So, I mean, really, I was kind, I was, not kind, I was very impressed with all the people that, uh, that were involved. So that's uh, this is why you did this because a hundred years ago in twenty in last year, 
100 November years. 6, yeah, so 1917. So we're we just were barely 100 years. Barely. And of course, uh, where we're standing here during that latter time period, 15, 16, and 17 of 1900s, they were preparing for a war right here. So the, the men were busy <coughs> That's preparing right. for a war, and the women were. Trying to get the vote. vote. Yeah, I know. I know. And it was an interesting because there's a lot written up uh, both for and against. Like, why would why should the women be pursuing this? Some thought it would help the war. And of course, others thought it was just taking away from the war effort. But from what I researched, all these women that I have this list of 150 very their names also popped up working for the Red Cross and um at, you know food rations and all that so there these women were were um on all levels at all levels they didn't um shirk i don't think from any cause that i could see so okay so what we're talking about as far as the grounds here was the uh, the plattsburgh idea and that was very much uh, what happened here and i think is every time we visit here we ought to point that out the, yep. that uh, the people who prepared for the civilians for, were trained here, the World first, yep, the first yeah. civilian and, training and, camp. And it became known as the Plattsburgh Idea. Yes. But if you search for that, don't put an H on Plattsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Plattsburgh g with no H I on know, the end. I and, know. And the Plattsburgh Idea, and it's just amazing history that happened here. That's right. And another topic, but That's still right. uh, worth mentioning. And we do have wonderful photos. And, and Rich Frost, can I put a plug in for Rich Frost, wrote this wonderful book. Starts, his story starts in 1814, and he covers the whole history of this military reservation right up until... I'd even say maybe a year and a half ago when he signed off and said, <laughs> okay, I'm done, you know. But wonderful, wonderful book. It's a one of a kind. And uh, yeah, you're right. And yeah. Is it available here at the. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll shut the camera off and move on. Moving right along, we're now looking at Marion Dot. Dot Inman Parkhurst. Now, Dot Parkhurst is, um, uh, was one of, I would say, one of the uh, three high-profile women in the county. There were others. Maybe there are four, but I've only concentrated on three. And she's one of them. And the reason is her name keeps popping up all over the newspapers. She wrote articles for uh, pro-suffrage. She, um, she was uh, a secretary and press chairman of the Clinton County Equal Suffrage Club. And this is, she was about, so she was born in, in, in uh, 1885, so she was around 30 when she was active. She had been uh, working for, as far as I could see, she'd been working for her father's insurance company, which was Parkhurst and Taylor. And if you see, that, that company was in business for a long, long time. Um, but the other special, she did many special things. She marched in, they had a march in uh, 1915 um, in the, um, uh, in New York City, and they, she was, she marched as a living star, and she happened to be the star for Washington State. Um, because she couldn't be the star for New York State because we weren't ready yet. So uh, anyway, that's one of the things she's very proud of. Uh, she was also the first female head of the Balance of Supply Division for the War Department in Washington, and um, then she was involved in all sorts of. Uh, had input into the bill for education and child labor, president of the New York State Women's Federated Clubs, congressional secretary for the National Committee for the Department of Education, and congressional secretary for the National League of Women Voters. And she was, I believe, if not the first, one of the first presidents uh, locally of the League of Women Voters. And Carrie um, Chapman Catt herself, who was a very high profile, um, in, in this whole movement, if not the highest at, at the end, um, um, nominated her for that position. They were apparently uh, personal friends. Um, but it's interesting about um, Marion, she's, she's one of many who um, sort of popped out of my research. And, um, and the families don't know a lot about this other than what they read, too, <clears throat> about this kind of participation. A number of the women, there's another one called, uh, whose name was Harriet Bell, and she happened to be um, Frank Hager, who's my grandfather, he was the one that got me started on this by finding him in the newspaper as an anti-suffragist. <laughs> and uh, she was his, um, his son's mother-in-law. So, you know, but Plattsburgh was a small town then. But Harriet, um, 
Bell from very first. She was one of the first names that appeared. And um, I can say this because my family did not have any idea that she was so involved in the suffrage movement. Uh, but I remember her name because my grandmother said, oh, she's she's pretty feisty. So she was, you know, <laughs> right out there and always an officer or hosting events or that kind of thing. And these women that were involved, like Harriet Bell, um, and more so, Harriet was here locally. Dot went on to to represent, you know, um, to help on a national level. But um, the women that were involved here, um, very often they were in the Garden Club, the DAR, um, uh, Tuesday Clubs, uh, and all of the, these clubs that I went through here. Very often they were officers of those clubs. So you can imagine that the membership was the same group of people. And very often when these clubs met, by the time they got to Dot, who was active and started her activity in about 1914, she, um, uh, they had stopped having these informal hosting, more of a hosting meetings where they had entertainment and they had food and, you know, that kind of thing. They got more serious. Mm -hmm. And um, so she was involved in, in the more serious aspect. Um, I, we have in our collection this wonderful photo of her, and her niece actually also sent me a photo of her in, when she, in the 1940s. So we have a, a, oh. a, a bit on her. Now I see the, <laughs> that first paragraph that uh, she was a sister to fellow suffragist Maria Parker's Booth. She's another one. She was she was at one point president. There were 400 women's clubs in New York State, and she was president of that overall group of, of federated women's clubs and so she and she too her name from day one was was active in that and um so but who knew yeah. you know who knew and we don't have diaries oh if somebody had a diary or but but we use the newspapers as our diary and uh so she was very active she i would not say um she was more low-key because she was more consistent than say dot because she she stayed here in town and 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 continued her her activities um but it's interesting they were 14 years apart oh. so so um the fact that Dot uh, may be uh, ascribed to what Maria was um, interested in is not probably unusual. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, they were both. And they both um, were in uh, um, clubs together, and they both traveled together to suffrage and federated women's club um, activities. So is Maria older than Dot, is that what you're saying? Maria's 14 years older than Dot. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And Maria is um, Kit and... and Robert Bob Booth's uh, grandmother. So, um, so that was very. It was you know it was very the Parkhurst themselves. So you know, this just doesn't happen. People, you know, um, their grandfather was John Parkhurst, and he was a supervisor in Blackbrook, and in Denimora, and I think he was an agent at the at the prison. So these people were out there in the political scene. They were raised in that kind of a mm -hmm. atmosphere. And their father worked for the railroad. And he, um, one of the, the highlights that we found about him was that when McKinley came to town to Loon Lake, he passed through, you know, and, and their father was the one, was the railroad agent that accompanied him. Oh. So, you know, it's, um, <laughs> these, these, they came from a, a political atmosphere, I think. Her, their father was, um, treasurer i think of clinton county he was he was very much a bookkeeper and that kind of thing so he was a treasurer of a lot of different organizations here and so he was politically also involved because you know usually your you, your treasurer is chosen out of the good guys that right. you like you know yeah. so anyway so that it, it's not that these women came out of nowhere they they had a ba family background that would have set them up for and you would hope that they would have gotten some support from the family. That well, definitely, because John Booth, uh, the, who was the father of Maria, his name appears also all the time. He he um, he hosts hosts a lot of suffrage meetings, and so he, finally, he was a judge. Finally, yeah. we get a man and some recognition here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had Judge Watson, you had uh, Mr. Veter, and uh, yeah. Um, 
it, it, it's interesting because it was the men's debate debating clubs that first hosted the, the debates, the women's suffrage debates. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's all right. And it's okay because it's not an anti-man thing at all. It's not. It's, it's just to give women the right to vote. That's all. You know, it, it, it's not just the right to vote, but uh, years ago, Bob, Ben, and I, when Coopersville Church, St. Joseph's Church, was celebrating an anniversary, Bob, Ben, and I were there doing a story on it, and I'm looking at this big thing that says donations and the, the workers that did it, and it was all Mrs. Joseph Bayshard, Mrs. John Doe, and, and it, none of these women had first names. They were Mrs. That, that's Mrs. Calvin Castine behind that camera. That's not Judy. No. That's Mrs. Calvin Castine. <laughs> it's Judy today, that's for sure. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you, that was one of my challenges, is finding out what their first names were. And one of the sources is the DAR. The DAR counts your first name. They don't address you as anybody's, you know. So the DAR was my first, you know, clue as to who these people were. You're right. Because um, Dot, because she wasn't married, you know that, and actually, I didn't know it was Dot until I think I talked to Kit, or somebody told me because she wasn't Dot in the newspaper okay. so much. So no, it wasn't use a nickname <clears throat> so much in the newspaper. Yeah, and I don't know where it came from, so <laughs> and I don't think anybody does. But any and and also, I was looking up some things in the newspaper, and I see that there, um, her father. Um, and this a guy named Inman were friends. So I don't know where Inman came from because these, the the Parkhurst and the Boos, um, and I won't speak for Kit's generation, but a little bit, used all the same names over. You know, for example, she was, uh, she, Millard was her father. Well, it looks like they had daughters, um, a daughter, um, Mildred. So maybe they were kind of giving up on having a son, and then they finally had the twins, and they had, they named one of those Millard. But the first name of their firstborn was John, after probably John Parkhurst, who mm -hmm. was, you know, the um, the father, you know. So it's interesting, the names. I, I was curious where Inman came from. Somebody probably knows, but I don't. Yeah. Because she went by that. Marion Inman, or Marion I, like she was very much, that was a part of her name. Yeah, that has to be a last name of some ancestor, right. I would think. Yeah. Yeah, and or one friend. more thing on the, on the women not being named. Uh, recently, I was looking up my grandfather's obituary, and it said he was survived by his widow. Doesn't even give my grandmother's name, yeah. then her, then the children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know. Not, I it's very that. frustrating because today we <laughs> we don't think like that and we don't look at things like that. Yeah, yeah. So here's here's um, here's our recognition that that gentleman did you know, support the women here. Although it's it's right above this is all the thi all that's the anti suffrage. That's a gentleman's coat. That's a gentleman's coat. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> yeah, it is quite beautiful. Oh, yeah, I'd love to roam around. Yeah, but town we gave him that. a cane. Yeah, I, I, I need that for self defense too. <laughs> Did he have a European travel bag with him too? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, yeah, we just because this is so beautiful and we ha we want an opportunity to show our textiles. We have wonderful textiles here. Someday we'll give you a behind the scenes tour <laughs> and you will flat asked you but um, so we wanted to use this opportunity to show all our textiles and this was a particularly beautiful one the subject of this poster is the anti-suffrage notes and these are amazing because this is what people thought and this is what was in the newspaper this is um, this was my great-grandfather um, he was a Plattsburgh judge and he said beware of educating women because the higher educated they are, um, if they go much beyond men, then they don't really want to do housework anymore. Basically, I'm True. rewording it, but that's the thought. So be careful. Are you, de are you denying that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he, interestingly, he allowed his, his two daughters to become teachers, which was a, a very acceptable to be a teacher. But um, the, sons, the sons were, they went to union. The teachers went to normal school, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Um, the other thing that was horrendous was um, this Bishop William uh, Duane, Duane, I believe it's pronounced, um, and Larry Gooley wrote a nice article about this. I, I had sent this information to him. I said, Larry, do you know anything about this? <laughs> and he came yeah, about, I don't know, a little while later, he, he said, yeah, and he knew a lot. Um, <laughs> but what was happening, there was an article, and it said, um, 
that um, women, women are freaks or freakish, you know, suffrage was a freak. That was the headline was freak was in the headline. Mm. And what he said, he was talking to graduates, high school graduates of a school. And they said they'll gain nothing by suffrage and losing every day and its dignity. And so they were saying that it was a hysterical clamor. And this was in 1909. So women, college, uh, high school students were being told that, that they would be freakish, freaks if they had uh, supported suffrage or if wanted to vote, basically. They lose their dignity. That was very interesting. Then we go back to the Plat Plattsburgh Anti-Suffrage Association. And there, they believe that um, the, the cause was opposed by women themselves, and there was some truth to that. Well, some women, some yeah, truth to that. Doesn't mean it's, it's right, but it, yeah. I mean, as a, a reason not to give them the vote. But uh, anyway, and the other thing is, um, after the 1915 vote, when it's sort of anticlimactic, you know, I'm, I'm sort of telling you the story before, but um, the anti, in, in 1915, they had a vote and they lost. Uh, we lost, we didn't gain, gain the right to vote. And um, they, this is what they published before the 1917 vote, that, that they said that, you know, we will be as smart as we were in 1915 and vote against it, you know. So this is the anti-suffrage, and this is also very interesting. I, that's why I have this, all this verbiage here, why we oppose votes for women. And suffrage is not a privilege to be enjoyed um, but if imposed upon women, it becomes a duty. So, uh, please, I don't know. <laughs> men of the state are capable of conducting the government for the benefit of both men and women. Their interests, generally speaking, being the same. And that was one of the arguments, is that the men, the men and women, it, it'll double the vote in some cases, and in other t cases it will negate the vote if, they bo if they, one votes <laughs> one way and one votes the other. There was some argument. Um, and the ballot in the hands of men has not proven a cure-all. So why would all of a sudden it be a cure-all with women getting the vote? Um, and um, the, duties, the duties of men and women would be different, um, as in the home, and they should be. So men's service to the state and the woman's has service in the house. So they thought that that would be at risk. And, um, and because we stand outside politics, we're free to appeal to any party. Uh, appeal. It was the was the only right that that women had, and that seemed to be okay. And they felt it was a backward step in the progress of civilization. So, I mean, they were really had 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 nailed what they felt was was the reason the reasons why uh, women should not have the right to vote. Well, you know, men named towns, Elizabethtown, Ellenburg after women, <laughs> hospitals, Alice Hyde, Fanny Allen. What, what more do you guys want? Well, one of the arguments in the newspaper was, what are the, what do you, I step aside when you come down the street. I offer you my seat, and, you know, if, yeah. if, and the other one was, you can also, you can, one of the, the arguments was, you can say no if I ask you to marry me. So the, <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> they based they based their thoughts on etiquette rather than you know or but they thought that that was a, a right that women should appreciate the fact that they could say no to a proposal <laughs> I that that was very shocking to me yeah yeah there's a little blurb over there that we missed I should have pointed it out but it sort of makes sense when you hear this is there's this this Alice um. um Miller uh, wrote a book in 1921 all about suffrage and things, and she'd been writing poems, and one of them was why women should not um, ride trains. And she should not ride trains because her grandmother never rode on a train. Oh, okay. You can get there by walking. <laughs> You know, it might take a little longer. But. <laughs> no, you, that was a reason. You know, so so she did a whole scenario on why why women should not be riding on trains, and one was the bad influence of the men on the train. You know, so they didn't want. So, anyway, it was it was uh, interesting. Then and, and they had a lot of those uh, those scenarios to use against in, for and against suffrage. Yeah. Okay, we've got another little. Uh, <laughs> Gown here. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes. Yep. And who said what when? I'll let you get close enough. Oh, there yeah, now. so I can read it, huh? Because I don't remember all these quotes myself, but I didn't find them. So they're all, they're properly researched. But uh, um, what's interesting is, oh, I know, this is, 
this is and I'll let people come to the museum and see some of this. Yeah, well, yeah, before, don't, don't just, that's uh, the in intent. You okay, know. yeah, this uh, open uh, when it is open. Um, we're the museum's open from ten to three Wednesdays to Saturdays, and um, this this exhibit will be up for a while. What's so. A while? It will, I don't know what a while is. Um, we <laughs> well, have a, a whole, no until I have this wonderful <laughs> group of volunteers that maybe sets it up as first in Clinton <laughs> County. I don't know. But it's, got, it's going to be sitting here for a bit because uh, federally, you know, we didn't get the right to vote until, you know, 19, the 19th Amendment in okay. 1920. So well, we, got we got time to share this story. But one of the interesting, the governor of Wyoming, uh, Hannah Lansing, who we'll talk about on well, the well, not, Keep the Hannah Lansing in your mind, because i got a question now, and if I don't ask now, I'm going to forget it. You said women got the right to vote here in 17. Yeah. And nationally in 20. Yeah. So could you vote for governor here, but not the president? No, no, you got full suffrage here. And those, all those up there got full suffrage. It so was you, called full suffrage. They could vote for president, okay. which is interesting because I think and I have not read this, but the logic tells me this, is that that's why Wilson, see, he, President Wilson was totally against suffrage. I mean, really, that's when they were having hunger strikes and um, being arrested in front of the White House because they wanted him, we've waited this long, can't we? And, um, but with, with all these, um, there were 12 states that had given women full suffrage by the time his next election came around. So methinks he uh, <laughs> changed his mind because he saw the votes, you know, he yeah, saw the he, writing on the wall. He blew sure. some states if, I he, think if so. he didn't get on board. Okay. But as we talked about, Wyoming was the very first, and they were very proud of it. And Hannah Lansing, who turned out to be uh, the mother of Clinton County suffrage, and we'll talk about her a little bit later, she wrote to him and asked him if it was working. And he wrote back, and the letter is in special collections, the actual letter that he wrote back saying, yes, suffrage is working out here. And he talked about the many benefits of suffrage for Wyoming. That was who she wrote to who? To, um, his name is John Osborne, the governor um, of Wyoming. Okay. And she wrote to him, and um, I think it was 18, 1894. Now that date coincides with um, the Clinton County Political Equity Group that was formed in the same at the same time. I was just, so, just going to say that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, okay. And uh, this, there, there. I just put who said what when because these people all said this, and it's all related to Plattsburgh. And um, so this was um, Reverend Anna Shaw, and she said, if I wanted anything, they said. Oh, this is cool. This is cool. It's often said that women can accomplish more by their influence in prayers than they can by the ballot if they had it. And she says, if I wanted anything from the Almighty, I would pray for it. If I wanted anything from a legislature, I would prefer to vote for it. <laughs> I thought very clever. I thought that was worth. And she said that in Plattsburgh. So <laughs> our Plattsburgh people heard that. Um, and, and Carrie... Uh, Chapman Catt was here, and she was the founder of the International Woman Suffrage Association. So she was quite a, a, a big deal. She was the friend of Don, uh, Dot Parkhurst. And so she said, if it must come, if the religion of democracy, which has been the life and breadth of this nation, is to continue, she said, suffrage, women's suffrage has to come. And um, then we have uh, the other side of it, Marjorie Dorman. Marjorie Dorman was the head of the National Society opposed to um, women's suffrage. And she actually spoke here. She came here for, for a debate, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But she said men have always recognized their limitations. Listen to how she says this. <laughs> and the scope of their work. The modern suffragist thinks she can do man's work and her own besides. Women may be clever enough to do man's work, Ben's work, but men are not clever enough to do women's. So she, she's, I thought, isn't she pro-suffrage or what? what is that? But anyway, she's definitely anti. And then there was, um, there was President Taft who said that women have been disbarred from suffrage for 139 years. He's talking about when the Constitution was right. came. Without suffering any hardship, in consequence, and their admission should be postponed as long as feasible. And that's the President Taft. Thank you very much. And he said that in Plattsburgh. Okay? <laughs> and then. Probably then, right at Clinton Community College up there at the Hotel Champlain. I, I don't know. When he was visiting. It could be. <laughs> and then, uh, then there's finally Wilson. 
he said they hoped that the voters of the state of New York would uh, rally. And that was reported in the uh, Plattsburgh Daily. Actually, um, I, I might want to, all these were reported in the Daily. I'm not sure if this, they actually came and said it here, but it was reported. reported the, and so this is what our paper. people read. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so this is when Wilson finally came around in October of 1917, <laughs> just in time. So All right. I gotta, I gotta point out you probably made an a error typo. Here. Yeah, because I see your Plattsburghs there have the H on them. I know. I'm stubborn. <laughs> well, these the Plattsburgh papers had H's, right? No, I don't think Are so. You, I think <laughs> that, okay, we'll check on that. We'll check on that. Uh, you might be right. You usually are right, but we'll see. No, we'll see. Yeah, you can talk to my wife when you say that, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> you say I'm usually right. <laughs> we have an a, a assortment here of different books and things like that. So, um, on, on, so people know that, that okay. it's being Wonderful. discussed. Okay. But you know what's very interesting is uh, One Woman, One Vote. This is a PBS home video. This is a video that's wonderful. Um, and there are a couple of others. Um, there's Iron Jawed Angels, which is, uh, is really people should see because it's, it's, it's a good story, and it does tell you the story of suffrage of Alice Paul. Alice Paul is a whole national subject. She never came here, so she's not part of our story as such. But... Uh, now, is there a reason for this dresser to be out here? To hold these. Just to hold. <laughs> yeah. I look in there, well, I won't find yeah, any you won't, I items. don't think so. No. Oh, empty. No. No. Not even a mouse. Oh, here. Chest of drawers donated by Lillian Smith. There we go. There we, we go. We got Thank Lillian you. Lillian Smith's yeah. name in, in, in 1977. Wasn't that nice? Thank yeah. you, Lillian. It was. Your, your drawers. I know. Are, I know. Your drawers are being put to good use. Lillian. I know. No, that's great. Well, we have an, we're not a house museum. So we have pieces of furniture, and we have to incorporate them into the Clinton County stories. And well, sometimes they are part of it, like the, the um, um, piano upstairs is a piano that was brought up the Lake Champlain and part of the Sachs family, and they donated it. So it's part of a Clinton County story. But, and this might have been, but I don't have any more details other than a description of it. It doesn't yeah, say where but, it was. But storage is such a, you know, just to get off topic here on a subject, but storage is such a problem for you guys, isn't it? I know. It's just, it is. Because you get so much material. I do, we do. And you can only display so much of it. That's so right. the rest of it is sitting in there. You know what I say? We're not unlike the Smithsonian, <laughs> right? What is their percentage? Three, four percent? You know, I think we're maybe a little higher, but might, maybe not. And, and the thing is to try to change things up and attract people to come back and see the change. We recently changed the military um, uh, exhibit the uh, our, our story out in the next room we've changed the um, arts and industry uh, exhibit and we changed our you know arts and leisure and then indus early industry so we've changed and we changed the hall up we have first now we're we're we hadn't before shown our gun collection we've never shown the gun collection and now it's up and secure and in a hall so in the hall upstairs so we try to change things up but it takes a lot of you know we're not for profit right we're totally except for me who i'm part-time as volunteer supported so you do what you can do you know but we really definitely when we take pieces into the collection i mean they have to be within our mission and our mission is to to collect and preserve it we have to be able to preserve it like somebody's given us a carriage well we we couldn't preserve that that's not sort of so we share with the transportation well, museum so things obvious, like that place yeah. yeah so if it's too large you know we can't we can't keep it but um, definitely um, yeah we have if it, it has to match our mission and our mission is to collect and preserve and share and exhibit yeah yeah and so with those exhibits changing don't think because you were here a year or two ago that uh, there's nothing. That's right. Uh, can I use the word new? Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> there's it, nothing old to see here. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you do come back, there's usually a new story, you know, and something to tell. So even even if like now we have the town of Clinton. Uh, exhibit downstairs, as you know. <laughs> as I've been trying to record for the past I know. year and a half. <laughs> it, which is wonderful, and we try, because we're a county museum, we try, we want to make sure every town at some point is e represented down even downstairs. Even Cherubusco, right? Especially, especially. <laughs> yeah, because it's, I mean, people often 
unfortunately, people will say, well, where's the town of Clinton? And we have this wonderful map that says, yeah, it's in the farther west, northwest of the, of, of the county. And it's right up there, and it's a sizable piece of proper land. And uh, usually they're sitting down, you are here in Plattsburgh, <laughs> and you look up where, the, where Cherubusco is so, or, or the town of Clinton. And the town of Clinton was very supportive in putting together that exhibit. They, uh, most of their supervisors came, or their legislators came to the opening, and people sat around looking at old um, pictures that were in books. Um, actually, we have two Cherubuskins. Uh, Are you a Cherubuskin? I don't know Cherubuskin. if that's the oh, name. Yeah, Cherubuskin is a word. Yeah. That's the name. Yeah. Uh, so Jerry Gagne and Jerry Favreau. Jerry's the president of CCHA, and, and Jerry Gagne is on our board. So, yeah, so we're got, kind of getting outnumbered even. <laughs> so, yeah, so. You have to limit the number of Cherubuskins. Well, we have. have somebody from Blackbrook, and we have some, me from Peru, and actually Mary Nicknish is from Peru, and then we have Plattsburgh people too. So, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, it, Jerry used to be from Rouse's Point, but, yeah. but originally, <laughs> so that, yeah. originally from, uh, from Cherubusco. Now she's from Plattsburgh. Yeah. So. yeah. But is this important before we move on? Um, again, we have we had these pieces, and um, I'm not sure if Judy can see through there. No, right. no. Well, this is the book, The American Family, that my great grandfather wrote. Oh my goodness! And so it's open to the fact that um, the effect of schools, um, the fact that modern mothers, um, let's say, only guess be safe to say, children, um, child is now molded more by the school than the home, and he was talking about all sorts of certificates. Um, statistics in this book and this book is just here for people to it's a research a piece of research actually about how people were thinking in what, the what year would this have been uh, he wrote it i'm trying to think i think it was 1909 wow yeah about that and he had statistics he was an intellectual so um and this is the uh, effect um the effect of education on the family. He definitely, and he was in a he was in a, a debate, um, and he felt that that any increased divorce rate was as a result of suffrage, of the more, this kind of approach. And so he thought it was the, um, the it, it was the beginning of the disintegration of the American family. So he was very well, very strict. Uh, you well, know. Let me. <laughs> It changed. Have, have we, change is not disintegration. Right <laughs> disintegration right? is not change. No, no. <laughs> All right, let's just cut it and move We're on. Moving over. To All right, we are now from 1900 to 1914. 14. And the reason I carved this out is because there was certainly a lot going on. First of all, nationally, by 1914, there were 12, um, 12 states, and you can see there the white states up here um, that had full suffrage uh, for women. Uh, so um, all, all in the West. All in the West. Yeah. That's right. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, his platform, the uh, Progressive Party, included women's suffrage in the platform. His platform, his was the first to do that. The others added it later. Um, these are the two ladies. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony, and they died in this time period. They died before they had the right to vote. 1902 and 1906. Yep. Right. Alice Paul, she was very important to the suffrage movement. This is when she started. Uh, she split off from the more conservative suffrage group and started her own. Um, they had, she organized a, a parade in New York City in 1913, and that's when women were attacked and uh, hurt, and, um, but there were 10,000 women marching down the street in Fifth Avenue, and they were attacked by a mob. Hmm. We did not have, in Clinton County, we did not have any of that kind of, I think there was one for, um, around temperance, um, uh, you know, sort of a, um, a protest, a, a street protest. But there's nothing that I've seen that happened in Clinton County as far as an on-the-street protest. Well, you bring up an important point here. Uh, women were also leaders of the temperance leagues. Yes. To get rid of that evil rum. Right, right. <laughs> so were any of these lot hand-in-hand? Hand? Did any of these go hand-in-hand? <coughs> Maybe I'll say vote. I want to vote, and we want to get rid of the booze at the same time. I th so, yes, some of them. Yes, the answer is yes. Some 
some felt that they should concentrate on prohibition and not on suffrage. Others felt that it should be both at the same time. Others felt if we got suffrage, then then you would get the, the amendment that pro prohibited alcohol, you know, which is what in fact happened, even though it got rebelled. But, yeah. But I'm but glad, I'm glad it got repealed. I don't know. About you. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I don't know. It depends if you know anybody that <laughs> like like around here. Nobody nobody knew the difference around here, right? Right. <laughs> because it's it's not because they're bad people. It's just because they had access, right, <laughs> through the border. Thanks to, thanks to Canada. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's right. That's another whole story, isn't that wonderful? Oh, yeah. It's a wonderful story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rums across the rum across the border. I think Alan Everest wrote that book. Yes. And it's out of print, so it should really be this. And there's a lot of people that are finding bottles these days, and you know, caches of bottles. And yeah, I saw one on eBay today. In fact, I just like click in Russell's Point once in a while, and it was a, I think it was seventy dollars for the the hard copy of it. Oh, of, of Alan Everest's book. Yeah. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, yeah. I have a couple of copies, but well, that's I'm not going to pay $70 yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So statewide, what was happening, that women officially um, <clears throat> were endorsed by the New York City Federation of Labor. So they were, uh, and this seems substantial, doesn't it, with 250,000 yeah. members and the Grange? Also, um, officially um, endorsed uh, women's suffrage. Now, Grange is a, is a farm organization, a yeah. farmers organization. Yeah. So well, it's a fraternal. I think it was like yeah, a fraternal. fraternal yeah. But it's it mainly mm -hmm. a farm, mm -hmm. farm related. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. So, um, and then there, you know, they had things like the, all the political parties in New York State eventually declared for suffrage. So you'd think that they were preparing for a gimme, you know, but they, that's not what happened. Um, and then there was a famous hike, the women from Manhattan to Albany, and 200 women wo walked 175 miles. And if, um, if they in walked 13, in shoes like this. Yeah. Um, and they didn't yeah. wear those. Uh, and that was in 13 days that they did they that. They walked in, in shoes like this. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so. Nobody could wear shoes like that. It's, it's only this wide. I know. <laughs> I know. And then here, though, look, and see this also they were touring counties and th they, this is the Withero Hotel back here and this group the New York State Women's Suffrage Association they stopped in Plattsburgh in 1911 and they spoke from their automobile it was decorated and Harriet May Mills who was president of the New York State Suffrage Association I mean this is in Plattsburgh behind mm -hmm. the Withero and uh, there were other ladies uh, Portia Willis uh, who was also an organizer for the Suffrage Association, and other people, uh, people from uh, Chicago and New York City. And they were traveling through 20 counties in New York State to promote the campaign for women's suffrage. So that was happening statewide. Here, we had this, um, this debate I was telling you about in uh, 1910, where there were two lawyers and a medical doctor on either side, men, of course. And the, it was the declaration Pro, the pro people said the Declaration of Independence declared all men to be equal, and the term men was meant to, in its generic form to include women. That was the pro. Negative. Women, and this, this sounds like my great grandfather. <laughs> women's suffrage would divide families, demoralize women, and precipitate a war between the sexes. So that was the debate that we had in Plattsburgh in April of 1910. And um, the press concluded that the uh, the pros got you know won. So, and then you know there were little straw hat, a straw vote taken at the Clinton County Fair, and women's suffrage came out well. Um, and then there was another one. I was ta telling you about Marjorie Dorman, who said something about women were smart enough to do uh, both jobs, but men maybe weren't. And she was she was anti suffragist. <laughs> anyway, she came to town and she was in a debate against, um, uh, against uh, oh, who was it? Har oh, Harriet May Mills. And she was a New York State suffrage, uh, women's suffrage. So, so these things happen. They happened at the Y. Very often they happened at the Y. And also at the county, county building. So, um, That's the, about the YMCA, not the YWCA. It was the YM. Yeah. 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 And these are just examples of important um, women who came to this this Cora Smith. She was amazing, but she was from um, she was from Washington State and she came to Plattsburgh and um, she knew and they had had the vote by them, Washington State. 
And so she said that uh, that was <laughs> equal suffrage was granted to states in proportion to the intelligence of their men. <laughs> okay. And in Washington, that there was the highest highest literacy average in the United States. I mean, <laughs> they well, they were coming well, to make a point. Sorry. So. <laughs> So Clinton County should have been the last place for women to get the right to vote. <laughs> you shall see. I don't know. That's not, you know. But anyway, that was what she was saying. Uh, she was saying, um, and she said, and also, she, I mean, the, there was this large, this was in 1914, and there was a large anti-suffrage movement, and there's certainly in, in Plattsburgh. And what she's saying to maybe make people feel better was that no one knew what became after when women got the right to vote, no one knew what became of the antes. They simply fell into line with the suffragists and did their duty at the polls because that was going to be one of the hardships was that it was going to be a duty to vote. Uh -huh. So uh, she's saying that. And uh, But what's interesting is there are certain women whose names I was looking for uh, in these committees and didn't see them. But I did see them after with the League of Women Voters and, and the groups that formed after to support, you know, they, were, they, all, they all meshed together, you know. So the antis, all of a sudden, their names were seen in, you know, working together on other projects. Uh, with, so it didn't, it didn't divide the county. We didn't uh, no. bear any grudges. And, no. And I got to point out to this woman who said that men aren't smart enough. I still don't know how to sew a button on a shirt, so. <laughs> I have to so agree you're with admitting her. a little I, bit? I have to agree with her, yes. <laughs> you I could can tie my shoes, but not sew a button. <laughs> you could if you wanted to. We know that. <laughs> so uh, there were lots of arguments, which is, is interesting, yeah. All right, we're going to move on. Yeah, these hats are just a small portion of our, our, our collection of hats, and we thought this was a good opportunity to show them, you know, the different ages, um, and the, a gentleman's hat, and because ladies were definitely wearing hats. They wore hats in all the parades, and that was the time of hats, so, and some were very, very gorgeous hats, though, of course, they were. You can see those in our portrait collection. I don't know how those men are able to keep those hats on, though. Really, huh? Yeah. Well, that was the interesting thing. Um, women's women's clothing, it doesn't show it here in this exhibit, but women's clothing has changed a lot. Men were very far behind. They still had to have their, their ties and their suits, you know. You'd see them on the beach rolling up their, you know, and women would be, uh, women's fashion seemed to change faster than men's did. And I felt, you know, you kind of feel sorry for the fact you still had to wear something <laughs> tight around your neck. It's like the it's like the version of the women's corset to me, and the women got rid of their corsets faster than the men could get rid of their ties. But never mind the shoes. <laughs> okay, um, so 1915 was a really huge year because there was going to be a vote that would allow um, a, allow a change to the Constitution of New York State, allowing women to vote and have full suffrage, and um, so that was a big year. Um, and 40,000 women marched in uh, New York City in this in 1915. And Marjorie Ladd from Rouse's Point, she was asked by her mother to march. And she's holding the Nevada font sign in here. It's very hard to see which is Nevada, but I believe it's that one. Anyway, um, because they couldn't hold New York State's flag because New York was not one of the states that allowed women to vote. So. Um, and nationally, um, and this is interesting to me, because if you look at these states, these were like the original states in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the New York, in the, the nation. Yeah. yeah, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New Jersey women were the last to lose their vote, because women did way back, once the Constitution was in place, any, it, New Jersey had been allowing their women to vote, and it was taken away from them. Oh. So, but Massachusetts, Jersey, uh, New York, and Pennsylvania. So you'd think of them as, I think of them as progressive states, you know, in our history. However, they did not, um, I'm sure they had their own suffrage story there. Um, <clears throat> and then we had the National Women's Party, and they had that, so two parties merged. Alice Paul, who had, um, had separated, and Harriet um, Stanton um, Blatch, and that's um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter. So they, they, moved, they merged nationally. We had one woman's party. And then over in um, Montana, who were, 
they elected a woman to uh, the House of Representatives, and every that was the first woman to the, the House. One? Yep. So that they were, you know. And then biplanes, I thought this was cool, were flown by women. The biplanes themselves were flown by women in 1916 um, because Wilson was sailing, sailing down the Hudson for a uh, ceremonial lighting of the Statue of Liberty, and women still couldn't vote, right? So here's this woman, <laughs> right? And so they, they dropped the suffrage petitions as he was going down, down the uh, Hudson. Um, and they also, um, and this is, this is after 15, but here nationally, um, uh, they declared May 1st, 1916, um, a suffrage day to remind people that, uh, the suffs, and that's what they were called, the suffs were, um, still in the ring. Now, locally, <clears throat> we had tons of stuff going on. We had bi-weekly pro-suffrage and anti-suffrage articles in the Plattsburgh, I'm sorry with an H, we'll double check that, <laughs> Daily Press. Um, we had suffrage headquarters on Clinton Street. We had a big convention in June. A whole slew of dignitaries, and I mean, these. this is to Plattsburgh. This isn't just New York State, you know. We had the largest suffrage meeting in the county on October 16. This is 1915. And... Um, but the amendment was defeated in Clinton County. They had a vote in Clinton County and the amendment was defeated. Um, it was defeated in New York State, but it was know, also defeated in Clinton County. Do you County. know how close the vote was? It was like 1,500 difference, 1,500 um, votes that made the difference. So, and I, I used to have that number, but I don't have it anymore in my head. I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was then uh, the suffragists, and they are is, not ets, right? Your ets were um, suffragettes were uh, from England and, and Europe. Uh, suffragists were the United States um, women. Okay, i <clears throat> make sure never to. <laughs> <You'll>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So what happened was, this is what happened. The amendment was defeated in Clinton County and in New York State. And um, the, but they continued in 1916 and uh, the anti-suffragists of course were active. They had another convention. Um, they were more active around the edge of the military encampment. And, um, and they returned at the request, request of General Wood. General Wood's uh, one of the, the, um, the the people involved in the Plattsburgh idea mm -hmm. and General Wood was in charge yeah. here and he mm -hmm. asked them to come back, the suffragists to come back with their, and um, so, and then there was a Plattsburgh branch of the New York Suffrage Party and, I, and everything seemed to be concentrated, all the activities were concentrated through them. Okay, you got some pictures here? I have pictures here because, and maybe I should move them up, but these are all people that participated during this time period. Um, that came here well, from Washington State. There was a congressman, Clarence Adill. He was very well received. Um, there was um, Portia Willis. She was very popular in the movement. Um, Alice Chittenham. She was an anti Chittenham. She was an anti suffragist. I believe she spoke at the Catholic Summer School. Uh, Thomas Conway. He was our lieutenant, a former lieutenant governor. He his house was where McDonough Hall is now. It's, it was a beautiful house. Um, and they're doing a, um, uh, I think on May 5th um, of this, this year, 2018, they're doing a, um, uh, they have a marker that's uh, at the Evergreen Cemetery in uh, Keysville that notes his, the fact that he's buried there. Okay. Yeah. And then Emma uh, Smith DeVoe, she was another w well known to the suffragists uh, lady that was in town. Um, and those are just pictures of these. See, there was anti-suffragist Lucy Price, and she may have been the one that was at the Catholic Summer School. There was definitely one over there. But it's not that the Catholic Summer School was making a political statement. It was just that it was an opportunity to speak, and all these people use those opportunities. What I found interesting, I thought, geez, but this is all small print, so probably people uh, <coughs> won't read it, but I thought it was kind of cool. Um, the banner headlines, you know, they called suffrage a war. It said that the Grange endorsed. Everything points to victory. This is 1915, and it didn't happen. Uh, debates, women want to vote. Oh, surprise. That was a, <laughs> that was a surprise that in 1915. <laughs> that was the headline, you know. Um, and all these are from the Plattsburgh Sentinel, the Daily Press, and the Republican. So I pulled these headlines out of there. Um, you were a convert if you were uh, 
a suff- supported the suffrage. And the suffrage is, is going, not coming, so that's anti, obviously. Um, prominent New York men on the anti-suffrage campaign, president out for suffrage, cabinet for suffrage, farmers for suffrage, Conway, that's our, our, our former lieutenant um, governor, uh, was for it. Um, suffrage snowed under in New Jersey. So, you know, so it doesn't look good in New Jersey. But this was a headline that our people were reading. So that's why I thought it was important. And how to vote. See, people didn't know how to vote. The women wouldn't have known, or no, I'm sorry, they weren't voting then. Um, they wanted to make sure everybody knew how to vote. So they did make an effort to do that. And here we're fighting hard to the last. It was in a war. So, and the majority in the state were against suffrage just at the, for the 1915 vote. But <clears throat> there's also, I love this. This is my favorite. Can you see this? <laughs> Well-behaved women seldom make history. We went to a conference, and, and, and I had to get that. I'm going to put it on my, my bumper at some point <laughs> after this, this exhibit goes down. But I am kind of well-behaved, but, um, so I probably won't make history. <laughs> but, I mean, I thought it was cute. Um, and so did a lot of people. So anyway, um, so a whole bunch of groups officially endorsed suffrage. So you'd think it was a no-brainer, you know, a federation, general federation, National Grange, National Education Association, International Council of Women. But then when you start reading down, you realize that, gee, they're mostly women's groups and women right. couldn't vote. <laughs> so you know what, if, if they thought it was good or not, was it a, you know, the Editors Association, which is helpful when the media yeah. is on board. Mayor's Conference, you know those were all men. Um, the Friendly Sons of Israel, I mean these people all declared that they were for, for suffrage. So I thought that was, that was worth saying. Well, you know, it's gonna happen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, it's so, you, you, you read the, the paper and they were so confident that that the vote they'd get the vote and it didn't happen and they had worked all these years and it still didn't happen so i thought that was you know how would i be if especially during 1914 15 you know when the coverage was better and and you could get around easier and you were right out there and boom you know so anyway do, do you know how it uh, the vote went did it was it broken down clinton county did clinton county endorse it do you know never never still <laughs> I, I won't say still because no no i don't say still but i do say that no part of the story is in 1917 when there was the final vote when we when you know new york state women got the right to vote clinton county still voted against it there were before there were 100 and uh, 1500 people against it the good news was there were only 500 people. You know, the difference was only 500. Before the difference was 1,500. So, so I guess. Clothing. I guess. But, you know, considering all the effort that was put into this, and I'll talk to you about this woman who was um, later in a minute. Mm-hmm. But what I wanted to say is, okay, there were many, many um, <coughs> nationally. Okay, nationally is when the women started to pick at the White House. That was in um, 1917. They started picketing the White House. They were arrested, they were jailed, and they went on hunger strikes and they were force fed. So that's that period of time. Wow. Yeah. State wise, however, um, we were gaining more and more, um, more and more support with more, more suffragists registered. Um, 993,000. So that seems it, like quite a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, you can imagine if you, as a man, came out. In, in favor of suffragists, uh, all of a sudden you've picked up 900,000 votes. Yeah. <laughs> you would think that. That's true. So what happened was, what happened was, and I've got the summary up here statewide because there was a little history behind here, but statewide, then the, um, the, the New York State, con- the proposed woman's suffrage amendment to the New York State Constitution was approved by nearly 54% in favor. That is not much. No. That is really close. (laughs) And they call it the first, we're the first Eastern state to fully enfranchise women. And that's true if you want to be a first, but then there are all these other states that were, you know, all the other 12 Mm -hmm. that that were before you. But New York State likes to think they're good, and they did. They did a good job. 
November 6th. But what was happening in the county, the Sentinel, the Plattsburgh Sentinel, devoted a whole issue to suffrage, and it was very interesting, in 1917. Um, and they talked about all the efforts, and, and it was the, just about the entire issue. Which, um, but they're the only newspaper that I could find that did that. Um, and the, ha the fact that the Sentinel was um, part of the Lansing family, which is uh, who, who uh, Hannah Strait Lansing is connected with. Um, the other thing is we got all these, these people involved. Remember I was telling you about the, um, um, all the towns and the villages. And so they were all, the, all these women. Cliff Haven is added to the group, I think, that uh, we saw over there. So That's in 1917. And yeah, yeah, now, <laughs> but it was a town, a little hamlet, I guess, at yeah. the point. And then we had all these these women that are that that I show down here that came to town. Um, Inez Mulholland, who I didn't talk about too much, she was a um, a suffragist, and we have a a, a a video about her life that was prepared. Um, it's about 15 minutes, and it talks about, she was from um, Meadowmount. Uh, her family was from Meadowmount. She was born in Brooklyn. She's buried in Lewis. And uh, she was a suffragist who died on, on, the, on the road in the middle, actually, of a suffrage, uh, a suffrage speech out in California. Wow. Yeah, and um, she had spoken here in 1912. Uh, but her, um, and, and then in 1917, her sister came back, Vida, and her father came back to Plattsburgh. I think, I have a note that says that um, the father had dinner with the Booths. So the Booths were still very, the, Maria Booth was still very, very active, and Judge Booth, John, uh, John um, Booth was um, very active still. I, I've got to ask though, these national speakers, how was, how were they, what was paid? How did they manage to do this? No you know, idea. It cost money to travel the country, and you got to. There was no mention of the the amount of money that people had to pay to go to see them. There was no mention there. Could so you... it must have been paid for by the National Association, I would guess. I, I mean, I'm just guessing. I shouldn't guess. I have no idea yeah, how it was paid. Because, because it had to be but they to they came the all country. the way here. Yeah, you know, to travel the country and yeah. stay in a hotel. Stay overnight. You yeah. know, the Witherall or wherever. We would love the the uh, register of the Witherall <laughs> for this period in time. I'm sure they're there. Um, <clears throat> and then here's the vote for the county, and this is what it was. That was 3,071 for women suffrage and um, 3,622 against. Seven districts were for it and 23 were against. So after all the work and the suffrages, and this was in the paper because these were, and this was put in by the women of our county that worked so hard. The suffrage of, uh, suffragists of the city are confident of the success of the polls. There is every reason to believe that the men of the city and county will vote to grant women the ballot today. And that was printed in the newspaper. Well, I guarantee you that if my wife said, are you going to vote for suffrage? I would have said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and well, then thank God for the secret ballot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, they worked really, really hard. And, um, and I thought it was worth discussing, you know, worth showing that they did work hard, even though for our particular county, you know, it was good news for the state, but our particular county did not show as well. And we weren't the only county. Well, obviously. You know, yeah, because um, apparently what happened, one of the big changes was New York City. They really rallied New York City to change the votes there. And so New York City was for suffrage, most of those places. And our rural counties were not, you know, it was not different because um, it's a matter, I guess, of of talking to people and getting out there and if you're only you know but i i was very impressed with all these towns that were involved i thought that they they all get our kudos on my well let's face it uh, altona altona was there yeah people didn't have spare time to go to these things yep. you know or keep newspapers to read necessarily yeah, you know yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they were busy keeping a roof over their home and keeping uh, the family fed to, to be out to going to the, these meetings and such so I know. yeah I know. They'd had the opportunity, maybe they might have changed their mind, but yeah. Okay, we're going to move on. So we're going to change move position. On. Yes. We'll let Judy change position. Okay, we are nearing uh, the end of the story. Of course, this story never ends because women keep voting every year. That's right. Um, we're at the Clinton County Historical Association. We're talking with 
Helen Nerska it was a director direct a director and uh, what volunteer yeah, volunteer and, and, and um, <laughs> suffrage pro <laughs> suffragist <laughs> I would have been I think I hope not a suffragette hope, though no <laughs> I hope I would have been you don't know how you would behave you know yeah, you yeah, have no yeah, idea what you. what you would do but I but I do appreciate I, I wrote I put there was an article in the uh, they. Caroline Keene asked me to write something about this for the uh, Lake Champlain Weekly and editorial. Oh. And so I wrote it, but I was a little, it was a little bent. But um, I, I was talking about the fact if you really believe in something, how, you know, use these women as your standard and then, you know, you better keep going because that took them so long to get the vote. And this woman, this woman you will, we will all know about. She's, um, She's her name's Hannah Strait Lansing, and she married um, Abram Lansing, who was the son of Wendell Lansing, the abolitionist. So she married into this family of active, you know, politically active people. And she was no slouch herself. She um, first she uh, I, she was an author. She wrote books. Um, she I don't know if you recall the. Um, Noted men and women of Champlain Valley. There, um, those are appear in Looking Back. Those appear have appeared in uh, all the Sentinels, the Sentinel, um, and she wrote them all. So if you come upon those articles, men, noted men and women of the Champlain Valley, um, I believe in an industrial edition of the Sentinel around uh, the turn of the century, all of those articles are in there, and she wrote them, and she's not given credit. Oh, wow. No, no, but it was there was there was later that was said that she wrote them. So she was quite an author. She was um, part um, an editor of her paper, The Sentinel, because um, the um, the Lansings owned the Essex Republican and the Plattsburgh Sentinel. So she was the editor of the Plattsburgh Sentinel. She was for a while. Okay. Yeah, they have her down in uh, for that. She was that for fifteen years. Um, she also, her, her name, well, I'll get to the suffrage part, but, um, so her lineage, she was the daughter of, um, Charles and, uh, Louisa Strait, and, um, the, the other part of her lineage is the fact that, uh, she's the uh, grandmother of, uh, Marjorie Lansing Porter, who was our local historian. Yeah. So, very cool that this connection, and uh, Marjorie Lansing Porter's uh, grandchildren, two of them have been here and have been in touch with us um, about this. And the only reason, <clears throat> other than the newspapers, which were easy to connect her to suffrage because she, she either hosted something or she was an officer, but also Marjorie Lansing Porter made a note that the first thing, that in, the first, what inspired her grandmother was when when Susan B. Anthony first came to town back in 1955 and she was a young young then and she was at whatever meeting that was and this is where she got inspired um, Susan B. Anthony is just as an aside she came again in, in 1879 and Harriet Bell who's the other one the other suffragists in town that made a difference um, she saw that she was inspired by that visit too. So Susan B. Anthony affected our town more than we might appreciate or know. So anyway, um, Harriet Strait Lansing, she was at a meeting, the meeting in the largest local meeting that they had on suffrage in 1915 in October, and it was a big meeting with with um, Con Conroy was there. Um, lots of dignitaries and she was sort of the, one of the speakers and they n noted her at that meeting as the mother of Clinton County suffrage but she died in May of um, that meeting was in 1915 and of course the vote was against she but she died in May of 1916 and uh, never got the right to vote and so never lived to vote well, so another she, one she'd moved out west she could have voted though. <laughs> that's right that's <laughs> so. right but she would Anyway, so Marjorie Lansing Porter was the first one that recorded her, the, the visit of Hannah, the, the, the connection with Susan B. Anthony and Hannah. And then um, <clears throat> Hannah was her, as a suffragist, she was the officer of the Political Equity Club and the George William Curtis Club. And she's the one that wrote to John Osborne, the uh, Wyoming governor about suffrage and got the letter back. And she and, um, 
she hosted Susan B. Anthony in, in 94, which was Susan B. Anthony's last visit, uh, and Harriet May Mills and, and Mary Seymour Howell, who we talk about over there. And so she hosted that, um, and she was secretary of the um, Political Equity Club at that time. And she spoke at the lo lo largest local rally in the county in uh, 1915 on suffrage and uh, the pre-event press recognized her as the mother of suffrage in Clinton County. So that is, um, she's sort of the, the end of the, the exhibit. Um, although we do have down here, we do have this list of women who, um, it's 150 list of women who participated in the suffragist movement. There are a couple of aunties in here because we did include them, because they did sort of participate in the movement. They were just on the other side. No, that doesn't mean somebody's aunt. That means That's against. That's right, A-N-T-I. <laughs> and um, where anyone who comes to the exhibit, or even if you don't have time to go through, if, uh, is if you, we would love them to look at this and see if they um, are related to anybody, and then they might double look in their series of letters around that time period to see if there's any mention of their activities, because... Um, that was probably the one constant of all the women that worked on the suffrage movement in Clinton County, other than the newspapers that pointed us to who their relatives might be or who, what they did. We didn't f find uh, any record of the, from the people from you know mm -hmm. right. in our documents, uh, and it was a huge major movement, you know. And so we're glad to tell this story. Um, I think it's, you know, important to know that there were Clinton County women that were really fighting for that right. So, yeah. Even though uh, they, uh, they didn't uh, pass it here, they... Yeah, and it didn't so matter. All the, they were all the pros that did vote added to the uh, state total. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. So that's what, the, yeah, that's, yeah. so... Uh, I know we mentioned it at the start of this program, but I want to mention it again. Do you think what you've done here today would be possible without the ease of research provided by this Northern New York uh, newspaper? Library Network, yeah. uh, the historic newspapers? Not for me, because I don't, you know, I have other things that I do. You know, I do have a project where I have original letters that I've been working on, you know. So I do have that kind of a project. But for this subject, no. No, not at all, because there's nothing... There's nothing written. Oh, by the way, um, I wanted to talk about the people that really did support this this project, and um, certainly the League of Women Voters locally uh, and and statewide. Uh, we had a an event called Petticoats of Steel, which talked about the suffrage movement that came to the Strand. The Strand Theater donated their building for that. The Rotary has. Um, has donated has given us a grant because uh, let me uh, let me step back SUNY Plattsburgh women and gender studies uh, are were very interested in this project and uh, one of their classes all the students um, six or seven of them were to write papers about uh, based on information I was able to provide through a PowerPoint, you know, a brief mm -hmm. PowerPoint. Um, they were um, to uh, research different aspects of Clinton County, um, the suffrage movement, and they took a very interesting twist. The Rotary has given us um, money so that we can print their papers and my summary paper of the suffrage movement, which will be given free to all the libraries and whatever, you know, so that it'll be down on paper finally. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, you know, Lake Forest hosted an event on suffrage, uh, Delta Kappa Gamma, um, retired teachers. So there are other groups that have um, learned about this through presentations and that kind of thing. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping I didn't forget somebody's support. Of course, CCHA and the, uh, the board here uh, supported and were patient because it took an age to get this up. Um, and, uh, you know, certain people on the board help certainly you know so it was uh, quite an effort and um, and I think we made you know we made an impact but um, I'm hoping um, the other thing was interesting and Penny Clute Penny Clute had done actually a presentation about the um, the women that were um, uh, arrested and and she has a whole presentation on the suffragette sort of suffragist movement more nationally 
um, and she gave that. So, you know, we had different different sort of aspects of, of suffrage. Um, I just don't want to forget anybody, but I might have, huh? You will think of somebody half an I hour know. from now. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the other thing is I came personally came out of this <laughs> supporting the League of Women Voters because if, and it doesn't matter what you vote. <laughs> just vote, you know, yeah. and because there were after the last vote, kids. There was a kid that came in. A kid, I kid, everybody's a kid under forty, <laughs> but let's say she was about twenty three or four, and she said, "Oh no, I didn't like anybody, so I didn't vote." And I thought, you know what? It's the only power. That, that, Write so, somebody in if you don't like everybody. That's everybody right. vote, you know. Yeah. So that's p sort of the message is that they work so hard for us to get this right. So everybody, you know, uh, should be voting. Yes. It's tough when somebody doesn't vote and they complain after. <laughs> well, yeah, there's really this, yeah, there's and it's the only real power you have, you know, is the vote. So, uh, and and now women have it. So the other thing, a question was after what happened after, um, and I only found two, and I didn't go into a lot of detail on the vote actually after uh, 1917. However, I did find that the, the first opportunity to vote was in um, 1918. Uh, and, but, but there was so much um, um, flu, you know, the flu epidemic uh -huh. that many people stayed away, not just women, men stayed away from the polls. So that was sort of the, what the, the 1918 vote. And then there was a vote about prohibition um, locally, and I should have more details, but the women were given credit for the way the vote went. Because which way they, did it go? Well, against it, of course, you know. Uh, for prohibition? For prohibition, sorry, yeah, <laughs> for prohibition, exactly, yeah. So, so they were starting to make an impact locally, so that was, yeah. <laughs> Uh, some that's things all. you can take away, but it's not right to have a beer. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's going a little too far. <laughs> well, as it turned out, I guess, yeah. 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 But it made for some great history in the area with the Prohibition. Well, I, th I think it was, it was really maybe, you know, it, it was, I think it was horrible at the time. I mean, they weren't making up the fact that, that, oh, yeah. that families were suffering yeah. as a result well, of, still of that. I mean, yeah. Let's face it, there's still a, yeah. a lot of cases of, you know. Right. It's, 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 and the temperance movement, as I said, worked with, with, the suffragists, and after, the suffragists, the names were all involved in, in the temperance and the League of Women of Voters. they ran out of that, so they got to have a new cause, right? Well, they were all the same politically active women, you know, whether it was DAR, Tuesday Club, whatever they were in, yeah, okay. and uh, the civic groups. So the, the Red Cross, most of them were in the, working at the Red Cross, so for, yeah. So that's the kind of women. And, and I do think that they were women who obviously had um, their spouse behind them. And, but they also probably had, didn't have to struggle to make a living so that they could. Right. And, you know, good for them. I mean, good that they put their efforts on yeah, this. Yeah, instead of staying home. And, yeah. and, and, I, and I, was, I, was, I don't want to end this with a, a real negative, but I, I just have to say this story. I was looking at the aunties. You know, I was very curious. Like, who were these people? And one of them, and I've, her name slips my head, one of them started up the Champlain Valley Hospital Auxiliary, started the SPCA in town, and this is all before when, and yet was an, uh, labeled an anti-suffragist. So th there's something about the anti-suffragists it, that it's, is a mystery to me because this woman was no slouch and really cared about her community. Mm -hmm. But... Um, just so didn't, didn't think it was necessary to vote? I so. guess not. Yeah, yeah, so. Okay, well, uh, I Thank you, want to uh, close with <laughs> one more plug for that uh, newspaper thing. Uh, I sent it to you yesterday. Yes. <laughs> oh, I was, and, uh, I was teaching. I was you want our first. <laughs> <laughs> I was researching something. I just, as I mentioned at the start of this program, and when I, uh, grandfather's obituary, it just says, uh, survived by his 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 wife doesn't mention her name even so I typed in Delia Castine in the 30s and 40s and all of a sudden it popped up that my grandmother my father's mother was the first woman juror in Clinton County and it was in the, the newspaper and a couple of the articles that said Della but the ones that showed who who it was is Delia so but it's you know so it's it's amazing. And this was in 1942. <laughs> I know. 
the first you would think before 1942 yeah. women would have served on a jury but. well did you see the re well you did the rest of it said well the w women were asked but they made excuses not to <laughs> So that was interesting because that was one of the arguments is that you could be tried, but you couldn't be on the jury. That was one of the arguments way back as to why women should have the vote. I think her first case, that. that case that she was on was a, a woman that was involved yeah. with, with the defendant. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. At first, and I was telling you, I think before, we want to, uh, having the first in Clinton County would make a really good exhibit, you know, I think. Because not only women, uh, there were a number of women, but there are also a number of other issues that happened first here. So, you know, yeah, so. I think there's potential to uncover some more history. So you're also looking for volunteers here? Absolutely, please. I think I saw a recent uh, plea for volunteers. Uh, oh, we always <laughs> plea. We always plea. I ask it, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and we have all sorts of jobs to do, ones that involve computers, ones that don't, um, ones that we can take, you know, two hours, three hours a week, you know, it's better to have a clump of at least two so you can get into something. Right. Um, and, and it's really like a family, you know, we're not, we don't, you know, people can do what they'd like to do. Right. We usually um, open, offer the different projects and they can choose which project they want because uh, we have so many that we can, you know, they can do. So, yeah. Um, okay, so how do they get all over the Clinton County? Just, just, just call me. Yeah, yeah. If it's it's five one eight five six one zero three four zero, or email me at director at Clinton County Historical dot org. County Historical dot org. org. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I would love to, um, love to have people come in, even just to come in and and talk to me, and I can show them around, and they can, because one thing we do not have right, we have a, well, we have a lot of talented people. And a lot of talented people that can do exhibits, but they're also doing other things, you know, like mm -hmm. one of our, <clears throat> um, you know, Jerry, Jerry Favreau's our, our, our president, and she's talented at fundraising and things, but she's got other stuff that she needs to do. So, we, you know, we need help fundraising. We need help with exhibits. We need help with working with our collection. That's kind of the easiest, but it's also fun you know, working with the collection, so, yeah. Well, I can imagine you get there and start digging through stuff, and all of a sudden, yeah, it's like throwing out an old pile of magazines, the yeah. old story. Yeah. You can't throw them out because you start looking through them, and, <laughs> and that was Well, later, you... what is interesting, and I was at a, a, a workshop yesterday that were talking about old newspapers, because we were talking about how, uh, how useful that source is, and um, some people were keeping them, and I... What we've done, and this is something a volunteer can do, when we get a stack of newspaper articles, old ones, we check the Northern New York Library Network historic newspapers. If the newspaper is not legible, we keep it. If it is legible, we say, you know, no, it's there. So it's very a new look at the way we deal with newspaper clippings. Now, if, if clippings come in an, uh, a, 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 a scrapbook, they might not, might not be, they will stay in the scrapbook because usually scrapbooks tell the story of a person, right. their interest, uh, what they were following and that kind of thing. So, yeah, but uh, yeah. And, and some people at this group didn't know that. And we, you know, you know we think it's, everybody knows this and they don't know about that wonderful source. Yeah. Okay. So we've been chatting with Helen Nurska here at the Clinton County Historical Association Museum. And... Thank Judy for running that camera, and we're going to close with Helen telling us the hours of operation here one more time. Okay. Uh, we're open year-round, um, Wednesday to Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., and um, maybe closed on a holiday or something like that, or for snow this year. We had to close down a couple of times. But um, other than that, we're open year-round, and uh, we just love having visitors. That's our, our priority. That's why we're here. Yep. Thanks, Helen. You're welcome. Thank you.